Good morning. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. Welcome to Full Measure. Thursday, Hillary Clinton faces the House Select Committee on Benghazi. The former Secretary of State will answer questions about the September 11, 2012 attack on the U.S. compounds that killed four Americans, including Ambassador Chris Stevens. A new Full Measure Rasmussen Reports poll released today asked 1,000 likely voters, has Hillary Clinton been honest in her disclosures and testimony related to Benghazi? 27 percent said yes, 52 percent said no, and 22 percent were not sure. Over the past three years, a body of evidence has emerged showing that eight weeks before President Obama's reelection, the administration, including Clinton, worked to steer the public narrative away from the terrorist nature of the attacks, security shortfalls, and the lack of a military rescue. It's the night of September 11, 2012, and while the Benghazi attacks are underway, top officials at Clinton State Department already know the al-Qaeda-linked Islamic extremist group Ansar al-Sharia has taken credit. Within minutes, that alert goes to the White House, FBI, and Pentagon. But four hours later, Clinton's public statement evokes the idea the attackers were instead spontaneous protesters responding to inflammatory material posted on the Internet, an anti-Muslim YouTube video. Oh, I understand, Father. Certainly a lot Last year, Clinton was vague on whether she and President Obama discussed blaming the video instead of terrorists that night. I, I don't know that uh, I talked uh, about it with him at that conversation. I believe the very next day. In Republican Jim Jim Jordan will question Clinton Thursday in this hearing room as she testifies to the House Benghazi Committee. This terrorist group had, had claimed credit um, and public statements made by administration officials didn't, didn't reflect that, um, that fact. The Benghazi Committee has obtained 50,000 pages of new documents and unearthed the controversial setup where Clinton conducted government business on a private email server. The FBI has now taken possession of it. Is there anything that you feel the committee has learned or done to extend the knowledge? Uh, we've got a ton of emails from her that none of the other committees had access to. We've talked to seven eyewitnesses that the other committees did not talk to. Uh, and interviewed 41 different folks who um, had information in, in, uh, about that tragic night. The committee's chief critic is lead Democrat Elijah Cummings, who's defending the administration's interests and has accused Republican Chairman Trey Gowdy of a political agenda. This uh, Benghazi Select Committee has become the committee to investigate Hillary Clinton, period. Witnesses interviewed behind closed doors include Clinton confidant Sidney Blumenthal and former top Clinton aide Cheryl Mills and Jake Sullivan, who share the same lawyer and were allegedly present at a Benghazi document sorting session a State Department official Raymond Maxwell says he witnessed in late 2012. I am grateful for the chance that I had to visit with the committee today. I appreciate all the time that they spent with me and the respect that they showed to me. Last month, Brian Pagliano, who reportedly installed Clinton's private email system, pled the fifth, which allows people to refuse to answer questions that could expose them to prosecution. He brought four lawyers, says one attendee. One of the committee's primary questions is why the public wasn't told about the Islamic extremist nature of the assault. We now know a Clinton official privately told Libya the attackers were affiliated with Islamic extremists, but the phrase was not used in public. Heavily armed militants assaulted the compound. Instead, officials continued the YouTube video narrative. We reject all efforts to denigrate the religious beliefs of others. Clinton Ambassador Susan Rice stayed on message on the Sunday TV talk shows. We do not have information at present that leads us to conclude that this was premeditated or preplanned. We learned much later that Obama officials deleted references to terrorism and al-Qaeda from Rice's talking points. Many deletions were ordered by CIA number two Mike Morrell after a White House meeting. At the time, the White House insisted their only edit to Rice's talking points was changing the word consulate to diplomatic post. The point being it was a, a matter of uh, uh, non-substantive factual correction. To be very clear, the White House did not make any 
substantive changes to the talking points. But in May last year, we learned the White House did make substantive changes after all. Documents showed Obama official Tommy Vitor helped steer attention away from terrorism. The White House, you. Me. Add a line about the administration warning of September 10th of social media reports calling for demonstrations. True? Uh, I believe so. More documents revealed last year show top Obama advisor Ben Rhodes coordinated the incorrect messaging to underscore that these protests are rooted in an Internet video and not a broader failure of policy. The committee is also investigating why the attacks went on for more than seven hours, but the U.S. military didn't come to the rescue. Greg Hicks, the State Department's lead diplomat in Tripoli that night, said he repeatedly asked for military help but was denied. Is anything coming? Will they be sending us any help? Is there something out there? The administration insisted no assets were stopped, no military help was available. But the leader of a U.S. quick response anti-terrorism team said his unit was stopped after they prepared to deploy. A small U.S. Special Forces team in Tripoli was stopped from boarding a flight to Benghazi to help while the attacks were underway. And three U.S. security officers stationed nearby say their CIA boss delayed them from responding quickly to help. I understand that you wanted planes to get to Benghazi faster. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said they simply could not get there quickly. I was speaking from my perspective I understand. On, the, on the ground in Tripoli based on what the defense attache told me. And he said two to three hours. In closed-door sessions with Congress, top military officials conceded military assets were available, but it was decided they wouldn't be used. The military ruled out sending an aircraft to buzz the terrorists and a show of force to scatter them. A special forces team with access to an AC-130 gunship took 18 to 20 hours to be moved, far too late to help. And the military says the State Department never asked for rescue help. Why weren't those assets deployed? Um, there, there may be a reason, a very good reason, but we want to know, and it doesn't seem like we're, we're getting all the answers to, to those fundamental questions. The administration insists it did everything possible and that nothing more would have saved the lives of the four Americans murdered that night. During the first Democratic presidential debate, candidate Clinton was asked about Benghazi and about using a private email server during her time at the State Department, making it inaccessible to normal disclosure. And I have been as transparent as I know to be, turning over 55,000 pages of my emails, asking that they be made public. But let's just take a minute here and point out that this committee is basically an arm of the Republican National Committee. It is a partisan vehicle. Hillary Clinton declined our interview request, so I sat down with her longtime associate and supporter, former White House counsel Lanny Davis. Davis made it clear he's not an official Clinton representative. Democrats are fond of saying this is a Republican witch hunt. However, that would have to include the New York Times, the FBI, Obama appointed inspectors general. Doesn't that poke holes in the idea that this is just a Republican controversy? Well, I make a distinction between the investigation by all these congressional committees and the accountability review board that Ambassador Pickering and Admiral Mullen undertook. And Hillary Clinton said, she accepted their finding of systemic failure in the State Department. That's pretty harsh. She would agree that this was very serious. There is very serious uh, systemic failures. The distinction between that versus the Gowdy farce, which is all you can call it, and we can get into that, is a big distinction that we should be making, the Gowdy Committee versus everything else. The Gowdy Committee has, it says, turned up 50,000 pages of new documents, interviewed dozens of witness, no, witnesses nobody else has. They have brought to life the existence of Hillary Clinton's private server, which was previously unknown, and a lot of other information, and they haven't even released a report yet. How can you say that's all just a Republican farce? The committee is supposed to be about investigating the tragic deaths of four Americans involved in the Benghazi episode in horrible tragedy. So, yes, what you just said about Congressman Gowdy is what they claim, but you notice 
Benghazi, after 10 hours of questioning Sidney Blumenthal, was mentioned twice. Doesn't it make sense that the committee's focus would at least in part be on Hillary Clinton, especially if they discovered she had emails they never saw, especially since she was Secretary of State when all of this occurred? Why wouldn't she be at an epicenter? No, she should be on the issue of Benghazi. And if they think that they can do a better job than the House Intelligence Committee, the House Armed Services Committee, controlled by Republicans, then we've got to see what they're going to do differently. Hillary Clinton is appearing before the committee. Do you think President Obama should answer questions about Benghazi? I think he has answered questions within the White House, but as the head of the executive branch, no, I don't think he should go before Congress. There's something called the separation of powers. Administration officials have acknowledged to me and others that mistakes were made, but they said there was no malice behind it. And yet, nobody really high up as part of making these decisions that I can see has been held accountable. In fact, if anything, a lot of them have been promoted. Why is that? Well, I think that's a fair point. I don't know why there should have been accountability and at mid-level management, uh, a lot of good reporting, including yours, has identified failures of communication. But we know from the House Armed Services and Intelligence Committee, despite all of the accusations by the Republicans, there was no stand down order. There was no uh, immediate ability to rescue those poor individuals, given the distance and the logistics. You are close to Hillary Clinton, although you're not speaking officially for her. Do you see a place for Bernie Sanders in a Hillary Clinton administration? <laughs> I love Bernie Sanders. I thought his performance at the debate and his graciousness about not engaging in the personal attacks um, would qualify him to serve in a Hillary Clinton administration. Whether he'd want to leave the senator or not, I don't know, and be up to the future president to decide. But the answer personally is I really like Bernie Sanders, and I think he's a great leader. The post-debate bump seemed to go to both Clinton and Sanders. Clinton's performance helped boost her poll numbers among Democrats. Sanders picked up in the polls, too, but seemed to do better in focus groups and social media. A head-on full measure, former Congressman Pete Hoekstra on America's failed policy in Libya and a startling change in ousted dictator Muammar Gaddafi. He actually changed his behavior. He became an ally in the war on terror. During the so-called Arab Spring, new governments rose to power in Libya and Egypt with support from the U.S. But instead of a new era of democracy, the result has been a disastrous expansion of Islamic extremist terrorism. Former head of the House Intelligence Committee, Republican Pete Hoekstra, writes about it in his new book, Architects of Disaster, the Destruction of Libya. In it, he reveals a surprising story. Libyan dictator Gaddafi had become an unlikely U.S. ally before he was ousted from power. In 2003, he actually changed his behavior. He became an ally in the war on terror. He paid reparations to the victims of Libyan terrorist attacks. He turned over his nuclear weapons program. And then in 2011, 2012, America turned its back on Gaddafi. We overthrew him with no plan as to what we were going to do afterwards. And today, Libya is basically characterized by just about everybody as being a failed state. It's now an exporter of terrorism into northern Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. It's your view, is it not, that part of the reason Gaddafi was giving cooperation to the United States and to the West is because he was afraid of extremist Islamic terrorists? I had the opportunity to meet with Gaddafi on three different occasions. In taking a look at the history of Libya under his rule, he was always worried about the threat from Islamic extremists to his own regime. Your book states that perhaps one of the big reasons the Obama administration was trying to cover up the Islamic terrorist ties and the Benghazi attacks was because some of the very people that the United States worked with and helped arm and train turned around and attacked the compound and attacked and Ambassador Stevens and three other Americans who died. We've done a deep dive into a number of these individuals and find that a lot of these folks had ties to radical jihadists, ties into the Muslim Brotherhood. So for a period of time, they would ally and overthrow Gaddafi. But when Gaddafi was thrown, overthrown, 
They wanted to take over the government. They wanted the United States out of there. And I think it's highly likely that some of the groups and individuals that we trained, we equipped, uh, ended up being the ones on September 11, 2012, uh, who attacked our compound in Benghazi and killed four Americans. Is that a failure on the part of the executives in the White House, President Obama, or the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton or combined? Both Hillary Clinton and President Obama bought into this strategy. I think the quote from Hillary Clinton is, we came, we saw, he died. She owned this strategy. Surely, though, the Obama administration did not intend for terrorism to be exported through Libya and for the United States to facilitate any of this. How could they have missed these things that, to you at least, in retrospect, are so obvious? You need to go back to one of the quotes from then-candidate Obama in 2007, uh, where he's saying that, you know, once I'm elected president, the Muslim world will see America differently because I understand uh, the Muslim community and their ideology and basically saying, you know, whatever policies we had under President Bush, President Clinton, President Bush before that, you know, these guys just couldn't interact and relate to the Muslim world, but because of my background, these groups will see America differently, and they'll be able to, they'll be able to work with me. And what we found out is, no, these groups, ultimately what they saw is they saw an opportunity. They do see America differently, perhaps. They do see America differently, but they saw it now as an opportunity, and they saw it uh, potentially, as, well, they saw it as weakness. and. You have to remember, these groups have their own agendas in mind, and just because there's someone else in charge in Washington doesn't mean that they're going to change their ideology. They hate the West, they hate America, they hate Western society, they want to, uh, you know, attack it and destroy it, and that didn't change when we got a new president. Hoekstra says Libya is indicative of a larger strategic failure in the Mideast. Thursday, President Obama halted his planned U.S. troop withdrawal in Afghanistan due to the increasing headway Islamic extremist terrorists are making. Ahead, we follow the money, and it leads to some pricey art that critics say comes at a cost of veterans. This week, we follow the money, and the trail of wasteful spending leads straight to the Department of Veterans Affairs. Lawmakers are criticizing the agency, saying the VA took some artistic liberty on some very pricey purchases. The committee recently found that the Palo Alto VA health care system has spent at least $6.3 million on art on art and consulting services. The Republican chair of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs fired up about the VA's expensive taste at its Palo Alto facility using your tax dollars. These projects include an art installation on the side of a parking garage that displays quotes by Abraham Lincoln and Eleanor Roosevelt in, wait for it, in Morse code that cost $285,000. It actually lights up. Also on the list, this stainless steel sculpture that cost taxpayers $365,000. All of the artwork that I have in the VA committee room is art on loan from the Department of Defense. I don't have a problem with the art. But Miller says he does have a problem with this $1.3 million rock sculpture and courtyard project. Artwork, he says, comes at the expense of wounded vets. The thing that bothers me most is VA keeps saying they need more and more money, yet they're not willing to prioritize and use the money that they have for the appropriate thing, i.e. health care for the veterans. So as the VA recovers from a scandal involving dozens of veterans who died waiting for care, it's spending $330,000 on this arc. Until VA is able to regain the trust of the American people and certainly those that control the purse strings, the Congress of the United States, flexibility is the last thing that we need to be given to the VA. The VA says it's looking into the spending concerns and working to create a national art policy to include commissioned art. 
not a great week for Obamacare. Insurance co-ops in Kentucky and Tennessee created to provide competition are going belly up. Now only 17 of the 23 co-ops created under the health care law remain, and nearly all are losing money. Separately, the administration predicts Obamacare enrollment will be flat next year at 9 to 11 million, at best half the original projections for 2016. Insurance analyst Robert Leshefsky says that's no more than 40 percent of 28 million eligible Americans, but 75 percent enrollment is needed to be financially viable. The result? Higher premiums. Leshefsky told me we have a complete mess in terms of rates. We'll be right back. A full measure thumbs down goes to the former head of Chicago schools. Barbara Bird Bennett pled guilty this week to steering $23 million in contracts to former employers for bribes and kickbacks worth up to $2 million. Prosecutors dropped all but one fraud charge in exchange for her cooperation. While she got rich on the back of students, 50 Chicago schools were shut down. The school system is $500 million in the red. And one final measure this Sunday. Full measure is more than just the name of the broadcast. It's our commitment to asking the tough questions and holding those in power accountable. But the communication should go two ways. Our inbox is already overflowing with your suggestions about issues you want to see us cover on this program. Emails like this one from Jim asking us to investigate the relationship between medical personnel and the pharmaceutical industry. Others like Paula in Texas suggested we dig into the credentials and coffers of some online education programs. Thank you for those suggestions and stay tuned. We want to hear more. You can send in your ideas to uncover examples of taxpayer waste or government overreach. Just head to our website, fullmeasure.news, to connect with us through email. You can also connect with us on Twitter at Full Measure News. And to submit more comments, questions, and notes, make sure to like our Facebook page. Thanks for watching. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. Until next time, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable.